you think outside the box. I'm also going to try a different one, maybe this one for triangles and some people, I'm not going to mention any names, we're talking about why is it a box when you name inside out triangle. Because inside out triangle, I mean think about it, what does an inside out triangle look like? What does it look like? A triangle? Triangle. Exactly. But it made you think for a second and that's what we're all about on this channel. <laughs> Making you think. So you're thinking outside the box. Yeah, I think the other sign, I think that's another symbol for something else. Oh. Okay, so we'll definitely, there's too many shifty eyes going. <laughs> We're definitely going to stick with, this, with the box, okay? <laughs> Hi guys, I'm Teray, and I'm here today with my family. I have my husband, and I have both of my daughters today. Even though when I was remote, she's here today. Woo! I have my oldest son, and then his lovely girlfriend, Welcome guys, welcome back. If you are a new subscriber, please, if you like the video, take the, take the moment to like, share, and subscribe, and hit that notification button so you can hear, we, well you'll know when all of my videos come out. And if you are a previous subscriber and you're back again, thank you very much. So, let's start today's mukbang. Today we have Pringles chips, and I always do like the little mini cans, so I picked up some Pringles chips. Sour cream and regular, some cold sodas, which are twist all. I got those from Walmart, and they're just out of the freezer. Then we've got some sauces, like we've got the Asiago uh, Caesar and the Yum Yum Ranch. Then we've got some fried chicken wings. We've got some bacon and cheese potato skins. We also have beef and cheese soft toquitos. And then for dessert, last time, I don't know why we don't eat dessert on camera. This time we're going to eat it. So for dessert, we've got chocolate and vanilla mini cupcakes. And as always, we have our napkins and some plates. And my little mini mascot. So let's see what people get first. Anybody napkin, napkin, anybody napkin? Napkins. Let's see what everybody gets first. By the napkins, Chipotle sponsored. <laughs> this is not a paid sponsorship. Thank you. <laughs> not a paid sponsorship. Although I do love me some Chipotle, which is why I got the napkins. <laughs> so how's everybody doing today? I sure hope that you are eating with us at the same time. If we're doing your meal time, we're doing our meal time with us as well. Let me pass out some plates. Let's see what everybody gets today. Gets first today. Please don't forget to show your booty to the camera. Exhibit A. The Tokido. <laughs> Thank you. And let's dig in, everybody. I forgot the hot sauce. That's okay. We've got the Asiago and the Yum Yum. And my husband has been really bragging about those bacon and cheese um, potatoes. He said that when you eat it, it has the like amazing cheese pool and all that stuff. So I've got to try one. I'll probably do that one first. And of course my chicken wings. And we're going for the same potato. <laughs> and I'll give you guys the first bite. And subscribers said, please don't forget, give us the first bite. So yum, yum, yum. Chicken wing. Uh, you hear that crispiness? Oh my goodness. Believe it or not, I've never had a taquito. It just seems like a whole bunch of tortilla to me with a little bit of meat. So is it good? Have you had one before? Sure. Okay. <laughs> What about you? Have you had a taquito before? Yes. How was it? Thank you. It was good. <laughs> Describe it. Yes. <laughs> it had amazing texture. Thank you. Sauce, anybody? Oh, somebody was enjoying that plate. <laughs> anybody need sauce? Hot sauce would be great. Okay, I'm just going to 
just gonna leave one over here. All right, that's all. One over here and then one over here. So we can just grab it as we go. So welcome back. This is actually part two of eight sex symbols from the 70s. Part one. Yes. <laughs> yes, because remember, I had a subscriber come to me and ask me if I could start doing happy horror stories. And I said, hey, I'll try just to switch it up for a second. So today is eight sex, part two of eight sex symbols of the 70s. If you guys like it, please like, uh, share, subscribe, and comment below. This might actually end up being a series. Like, we can do the sex symbol of the 80s, the sex symbols of the 60s, go back to the 30s, the 40s. We can take it there. So if you like it, please comment below. Let's get back to it. We did 
Diane Carroll. Thank you. Beverly Johnson. Jane Kennedy. Etta James. Lola Falana. Judy Pace. Pace. And Diane Carroll. Now, as I was growing up, I was actually born in the North, but raised in the South. So me growing up, the, Cauca the Caucasian sex symbols that I used to like were Marilyn Monroe, of course she's everywhere, she still is everywhere. Barbara Mandrell, who was a country singer. She had a TV show on that come on like Sunday right before you went to bed and then went to church. It was her and her sisters, great job. I thought she was a dog. But my all time favorite, and she's still up there today, and I just saw on TV today, she's coming out with a Christmas album. So not only am I gonna get Ed James a Christmas album, I'm now gonna get her a Christmas album too. <clears throat> Miss Dolly Parton. Were they sex symbols? Dolly Parton? Yeah, I don't know what to say. Marilyn Monroe? No. Mandrill. <laughs> Mandrill sisters? Yes. Well, I don't know if the other two sisters were, but Barbara was very talented and she was super adorable. So sorry guys, I had to answer the list. That's just what was going to happen to you. 
However, she didn't believe in it. She actually fought back her attacker. Now I'm going to say that one more time. This is a big thing back then because they just didn't do it. She fought back her attacker and he was unsuccessful. So this young woman was not only beautiful, intelligent, but she was a fighter. So after she had left the play Playboy Club, she decided that she wanted to go ahead to Broadway because this was her dream. She's been growing up singing and dancing all her entire life. She wants to get on Broadway. On Broadway, she does do a couple of plays. And as a matter of fact, she actually became the first African-American to be a lead on TV. Now, I'm, I did not say that correctly. Let me say it one more time. She was one of the first African-Americans to be a leading role on TV because remember Diane Carroll did too in her TV show Julia. So it was all around that same time. So she got on a TV show called The Lieutenant, doing her thing, killing it. And Jean Roddenberry, now, let me back up for a second. When I was growing up, our household was straight up Star Trek. Straight up. We had one TV and my father dominated that TV. So when you went outside and were playing, when you came back home, washed up, and had dinner, whatever my father was watching on TV, like MASH, what was that, uh, t uh, Kojak, stuff like that, you had to watch it because there was only one television. So he liked Star Trek, therefore we liked Star Trek. And then as you got older and we got more TVs and stuff, we still would just watch it on our own because we already knew all the characters and stuff. I ended up marrying a man who loves Star Wars. <laughs> so now you see... Better, better than Star Trek. <laughs> He's saying it's better than Star Trek. We have had this battle for decades. I tried to raise our kids as Trekkies. That's why some people in the room know what this emblem is on their shirts. <laughs> they know what this shirt means. They know the hairdo. <laughs> Other people are like, what's up with your hair? <laughs> what's that on your shirt? <laughs> I tried to raise everybody as a Trekkie, but apparently some people weren't paying attention. So then when I started doing my first YouTube channel, I was like, all right, well, let me start watching Star Wars. And plus, he would always drag me. Anytime a new Star Wars movie came out, I got dragged to these movies. And I'm sitting there like, if Jar Jar Bing says something one more time, <laughs> I'm going scream. <laughs> I only like Vader. That's it. I only like Vader. <laughs> so as I did my other YouTube channel, I decided to try to make food to go along with Star Wars movies. So I had to sit down by myself. He wasn't even watching it no more. And I watched from the beginning to the end. And I'll tell you, by the time I made it to The Mandalorian, I was a Star Wars fan. It took all of that kind of brainwashing, though. It took all those movies to brainwash me to finally get me to like Star Wars. That's why in a previous video, I was wearing a baby Yoda shirt. I don't know if you noticed that. And every time I go outside, ladies that are around my age are like, oh my god, I love your shirt. I was like, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so let me go back to Star Wars. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me. That just dropped my mic. Um. What's the difference between Star Wars and Star Trek? Oh no. <laughs> what is better? <laughs> Star Wars. <laughs> That's the difference. <laughs> well, I sure hope the mic picked up on what just happened over here. Star Wars is boring. <laughs> oh, he said Star Wars is boring. Thank you. No, it's Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you looking? Star Wars is good. Star Trek is boring. <laughs> wow. <laughs> because I am a fan of both now, I try to be as objective as possible while I'm blinking constantly. <laughs> to me, and again, I ask you people not to come for me, okay? I'm just giving my opinion here. I think Star Trek is better. Star Trek is more cerebral. You have got to start watching it from beginning to end to fully get all that Gene Roddenberry, which is where we're going back to him, he's the one that sat down and wrote this. All the things that Gene Roddenberry was trying to do, and especially back then in the 60s when the original show came out, he was light years ahead of thinking. Like he knew all the technical terms, all the stuff that was happening. 
He had all the different races mixing together. He had everybody as equals, which is why the show is good. But it's not real physical. You know, it's not like, I mean, I was sitting down and watched one episode recently, and he was like, that was a fight. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was basically like, dude, bend his wrist and then karate chopped him on the back and that was the end of the fight. <laughs> <laughs> like, I can't believe that was the fight. And the fight was over. That was it. <laughs> Whereas Star Wars is a full adventure. You know what I'm saying? I could take my five-year-old nephew or I could take my 50-year-old uncle. It's a full adventure that spans over a series of times. Again, they were light years ahead in their thinking as well. And I got to tell you, well, yeah, they have the best villain. Darth Vader, I mean, he's epic. As soon as he gets on the screen, everybody's like this. <laughs> what is Vader going to do? Now, Star Trek does have some good ones. You've got the Borg, you've got uh, the Vulcans, but nobody compares to Vader. So I would suggest, if you're interested, Go back and watch the TV show Star Trek, the original, because it's on Netflix. I just told my father this the other day, and he was like, what, it's on there? Yep, it's on there. So you go to Netflix and watch the ones from the 60s, mm -hmm. then you can watch The Next Generation, then you can watch all the other ones, like Discover Discovery and all that stuff. Those aren't as well, but start with the original, then go to Star Trek, The Next Generation with Picard. And then to go to Disney Plus and start watching Star Wars movies from beginning to end. So that way you can kind of judge for yourself, hey, which one is the best. <laughs> okay, so let's circle back, circle back to Mr. Gene Roddenberry. Again, he was a very forward-thinking person. On TV, on those, in those times, you did not have black actors or actresses having good roles. They were either slaves, maids, day, daycare workers. I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with those jobs, but that's what young black children had to look forward to. Oh, okay, when I grow up, I'll just be a maid. He did not have the races mixing. There was no, oh, I'm dating this guy, oh, I'm dating that guy. You date who you date, who you date, period. But Roddenberry mixed it all together, all together. He was thinking about cultures 30 years from now. So, um, <laughs> what was her name? The lady who plays Lieutenant Uhura, and that's Swahili for Blossom. I want to make sure, and I'll add in the comments to make sure that I'm correct. But I know it's Swahili. Because she sat down with Gene Boddenberg, because at that time they were having a relationship. So she sat down with Gene Boddenberg, and they created the Lieutenant Uhura character to strengthen her, to make her a full embodied person. So um, she was actually playing on the Lieutenant when Gene saw her. He took her over that TV show and said, hey, I got a new TV show. Let's do this. It's called Star Trek. And she was like, okay, okay. I'll just put Broadway on the hold for a minute and I'll get on TV. So, Miss Nichols, and her, her name is Michelle Nichols, for those of us who would like to Google it and see what Michelle Nichols looks like. Wow, those of you that are there, I will interject it on the computer. But her name is Nutshell. In as a Nancy, Michelle Nichols. Lieutenant Uhura is now on the TV show Star Trek, the original. And she is the lieutenant in charge of communications. You've got Captain Kirk, you've got uh, Captain, what is he, Captain? Lieutenant Spock? Ooh. Lieutenant Doctor, Spock. Doctor. Thank you. Doctor. Was he Dr. Spock? No. Dr. Spock. Okay, Dr. Spock. <laughs> you've got uh, Bones, who was at, an actual doctor. Um, you got the guy that was at the bottom, I forget what his name was, and he was like, I can't do it, Captain, I don't have the power. That type of thing. He was an engineer. So all of them were basically on, you gotta show a better picture of that. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I showed this one. Okay. That's yeah, the that, yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> She was showing the actual picture that inspired the shirt and the, <laughs> and the nails. Was, was Spock a doctor? Or, uh, I don't think Spock was a doctor. I think he was a lieutenant and then he becomes a captain later on. Guys, help me out of here. I think his name is Dr. Spock. I think you're mixing him up with the actual Dr. Spock who was uh, like psychologist <laughs> who helped kids, parents, oh. teach their kids. On Star Trek? No, no. In real life, it was a Dr. <laughs> Spock <laughs> who had a book in the 70s. <laughs> And he taught parents how to raise their kids and potty train the kids and 
stuff like that. Uh, it might be fixed. Oh, yeah. Anyway, we'll figure it out. Especially if those of us who have Google at our disposal right now. His name was Leonard Nimoy. You played Spock. I don't know, or be a change myself, I don't know it. Yeah, I think they Because that's Spock. Thank you, Mr. Spock. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Spock. Okay. So the main part part here that I'm talking about is that they were all considered equal, no matter what the race was. So you know, Michelle Nichols, she was doing her thing. She was like, "This is great for the first season," and she was like, "This is not my love, though." You know, Jean, I don't love this. I love getting on stage, singing and dancing and all that good stuff. So, I'm going to give you my two-week notice. And he was like, oh, my God, Michelle, don't do this. You don't understand what I'm doing. You can't see what I'm doing here. I'm trying to let the world see that people can, of all races and colors and cultures can't all get along. She's like, uh-huh, that's all great. I'm going back to Broadway. He was like, Michelle, take the weekend. Think about it, doc. Just think about it. If you still feel the same way, come back to me on Monday. I am not going to like it, but I will accept your resignation. She's like, okay. Now, Michelle was a very big advocate of civil rights, equal rights. So she went to an NAACP. Like they had like a dinner there. And she's just sitting there eating and chilling, you know, being supportive. And she gets a tap on the shoulder. And it's this guy. And she's like, hi. And he's like, hello. I have your biggest fan. He wants to meet you. Can you just, you know, say hi? And she's like, okay. And so she's just eating her food. You know, just enjoying everything. You ready to say hi to this man? Maybe give him an autograph, whatever. She says she looks up. And it's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. She said she couldn't even speak. All she heard was air escape out of her mouth. And he was like, Miss Nichols, you are doing such a wonderful job on this show. This show is the only show that me and Coretta, my wife, will let our three children stay up late to watch. Because what you're doing is groundbreaking. You are showing young kids that when they grow up, they don't have to just be what the world thinks that they can be. They can do and be anything. And I want to get his quote exactly correct. He said, seeing someone like Lieutenant Uhura on that stage, right behind the captain, she is one of the most important people on that bridge. When she says captain, everybody turns around. And it's true. She's sitting there at the at the console. She turns around, she says, Captain, and everybody pays attention to her. And she was like, Oh my god. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate what you're saying. You know, this is great. <clears throat> the only thing is, I think just turning my resignation. I'm going back to Broadway. And he was like, stone face. No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. You're staying on that show. And she was like, in the back of her head, because <laughs> I know what she was probably thinking. She was like, uh, you ain't telling me what to do. <laughs> but this is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. here. She's like, I'll think about it. And he was like, you, you can't shy away from this responsibility. You have to do this. So she said she went home and she actually cried. She was like, why me? <laughs> why do I have to have this responsibility on my, on my shoulders? And I was watching her interview and she said after she cried, she got mad. She was like, anybody else could do this. Why does it have to be me? She said by the end of the weekend, she had thought about it. And she didn't even know what she was going to tell Mr. Gene Roddenberry when she got into his office on Monday. She walks into his office on Monday. He's looking at her, hopeful eyes, and she's like, I never believe what just happened to me over the weekend. And she tells him everything. 
And he said, after he heard what happened, he was like, finally, somebody gets it. Thank God for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Finally, somebody gets what I'm doing. And she said, Jane, I'll stay. So she stayed on the show. Thank you. She was so good on that show. There's so many times she was like dancing and singing. She actually used to sing on the show. The show was great. So everybody, have a nice time doing the show. He, he was the one that actually told her that you can't leave because you actually did change the face of um, the face of, of TV in history. What did I say? I said you changed the face of TV forever. It was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So she continues on the show. Now she's making friends with Captain Kirk and they have a good time. All the castmates. Again, guys, y'all gotta remember, this is like the 70s. So Jean is like, let's push the envelope again. We're gonna have the first interracial kiss. And she's like, whatever. It's just a kiss. And Captain Kirk is like, <laughs> she said, it. see, nowadays, that would be politically incorrect. <laughs> but she said out of her own mouth. It was fun back then, because they were friends. And he was like, he had been wanting to kiss her, but she refused to kiss him. So now they have to do it on camera. Hold on, who was it? Captain Kirk. Oh. So they set up the scene, and I'll interject it here. And if you have to Google it, you can actually Google it. Their first, their first interracial kiss between Lieutenant Uhura and Captain Kirk. And the, the way they did it, the way the writers wrote it, was that you know, they were taken over by these aliens. And the aliens was mind controlling them. And so they had to do it. Even though they were fighting against it, they had to do it. She said to her, it was the corniest thing ever, but she had to do it. So the TV execs come over to the director and they're like, this can't happen. So the director comes over to them and she said, the director didn't even pay attention to her. He just paid attention to Kirk, which was kind of disrespectful. So she said, I'm leaving. When y'all figure this out, y'all let me know. So they figured it out, and they bring her back. So Kirk, being a prankster that he is, he said, all right, guys, let's do this. Let's do the kiss. So they do the kiss, and they're fighting each other, and they break up. And he's like, you know what? I really kind of wasn't feeling that take. Let's do the kiss again. And she's like, oh, my God. So they do the kiss, and then they break up, and he's like, mm, let's try it one more time. So they end up doing this six times. Now by this time, clock is ticking. Because remember, TV shows only are like, they only last for a certain amount of time. So the director's like, come on guys, clock is ticking, we gotta get the good one in. The director's like, okay. So he said, let's do this last one. So he grabs her, he pulls her close, he bends her over, he looks down the camera, then he looks back up, and he's looking cross-eyed. <laughs> and the director says, cut! Now nobody knows this has happened except for the cameraman who's cracking up. Everybody else thinks, hey, that was a good take, they didn't kiss, let's air this one on TV. So they go back and they come back the next day. They show it to the TV execs. They show all five of the real kisses, and then they show the cross-eyed kiss. <laughs> So the TV executives begrudgingly say, let's go to kiss. So they aired the kiss. Now they thought they were going to get a whole bunch of backlash from all these southern states and people going to boycott. They said that 99% of the fan mail that they got was all positive. It was all positive. And Michelle said even to this day she don't get it. Because that's what she saw her life. Because remember I told you her grandparents were interracial. So she was like, what? It was like grandma gets a grandma. It was the same thing. So that's how the first kiss comes out. And if you watch it on YouTube, there's a whole bunch of comments saying, what? This wasn't a big deal. It all actually kind of looked awkward. But you have to remember back then, this did not happen. So this was actually groundbreaking. So that's how the first interracial kiss happened on TV. So were they like dating on the show for a long time? Who? Her and her? No, they were just friends. It was almost like a brother-sister thing. That's why he kept messing with her. Oh, it was just a, yeah. like that. 
Not her and Gene Roddenberry, they were dating. Uh, but not her, uh, not her and Kurt. They were uh, you know, having fun or whatever. So the show goes off and everybody knows the turn of her, seriously. She's popular, she's doing her thing. Nassau comes to her. The Nassau! Nassau comes to her. And they're like, Hi, could you help us? You know, we want to go ahead and do some video. And she was like, no, no, no. Because we just watched people land on the moon not that long ago. And there was no women there. There was no minorities there. And so they were like, okay, Michelle, you can still do the videos, but you can help us attract minorities and men. And she was like, okay. So she went around doing all these different videos for NASA attracting minorities and women. Matter of fact, she actually, uh, her video attracted the first, the first female astronaut, Miss Sally Ride. It was all because of Michelle Nichols in that video. She also attracted the first black astronaut and the first black female astronaut, Miss Mae Jameson. All because of what Michelle Nichols did in those videos. Not only that, but she earned an honorary degree from LA Mission College. She actually got an asteroid named after her. It's called 68410 Nichols. And that's the asteroid that was in the space in 2001, August 16, 2001. She was the first black woman in space for fake who recruited the first black woman in space for real. And one of the, besides, you know, Hail of Frequency's open captain and living on the prospect, one of my favorite quotes that she has is, I'm actually, when she was doing her videos, I'm speaking to the whole family of humankind, minorities and women alike. That was Michelle Nichols. I love her. She's still living. Yes, yes, sir. She's still living. She has a son, but uh, I think she's older now. I think she's she's got some medical issues like dementia or senility or something like that. Oh, yeah. yeah, but it's a whole. I mean, it's a whole lot about her and all the work that she did. And she said she never shied away from the Star Trek fan club. Never. Like a lot of them for a while were trying to shake off that typecast of being a Star Trek a Trekkie, and not her. She said she loved every single minute of it. Okay, and we'll be right back with the last one for the 70s. Hi guys, welcome back. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and do our eighth, or our eighth, sex symbol from the 70s. Now, before I do that, I did want to mention that um, as I was growing up, my mother gave me a set of advice. So did my aunts and my grandmother, my great-grandmother. And I try to pass those rules or slash advice down to my daughters. And I just wanted to share them really quick with you. So the first one is you don't put your love life in the street. You just don't do that. You don't tell everybody what you're doing. If you're walking somewhere, make sure that you are completely aware of your surroundings. You're not just walking tunnel vision. You're always checking out everything. We call it eyes akimbo. If you go to the bathroom in a public place, you always go in pairs. Don't just go by yourself as a female. If you buy a drink at a bar, you are to drink that drink. You do not get up, go dancing, and then come back and drink your drink. If you do do that, throw the drink away and buy another drink. And then one more. And don't accept drinks. I'm sorry. Don't accept drinks. Exactly. Don't accept drinks either. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> And then another one is, you never want to look up and be in a situation where you are the only female surrounded by males. You never want to do that. You're not going to be having such a nice time party, you know, you're out, and then you look up and it's just you and six dudes. Don't put yourself in that position. So I always held on to those rules, kept them personally to me, and I also shared them with my daughters. Now this beauty, who I'm about to speak of, the last one for the 70s, 
she has to deal with all of those rules in her story. Let me tell you. I am talking about Miss Pamela Suzette Greer. And if you are watching it on the laptop, I mean on the internet, I will interject, and I mean there's thousands of pictures of her. <laughs> but if you are here and you have your phone Google, look up Pam Greer, G-R-I-E-R. -E now Miss Greer, she was born May 26, 1949, so she's a May baby, woo! Same as me. In the 70s, she's around 21. And she was born in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Now, my life growing up in the 70s, I always thought about Pam Greer one way. But by the time I immersed myself in her story and read and researched more and more about her, I came out a totally different way. Thinking about her a totally different way. Let me take you there. So this lovely lady was born to a African American father and a Cherokee native mother. And at one point in her career, Quentin Tarantino, that director, he pegs her the first female action star. Now, when Pam Greer was six years old, her parents took her to her aunt's house. And they left her there for the while. I guess the aunt was supposed to be babysitting. And the aunt left as well, leaving her alone with two older boys. These two older boys, because they're all alone in the house together, they attacked her sexually. And she was only six years old. And she said it took her so long to get over that pain. And she even developed a stutter. So even she said she still even has it to this day. It's like a, de a defense mechanism. All because of something that happened to her when she was six years old. Her, her family, once they found out what happened to her, she said that they felt so much shame and guilt that it took the whole family a long time to get over that instance that had happened to her. Now her father was in the military, so they moved around a lot. And when she ended up in um, Denver, Colorado, and she was in high school, they actually started a band, her and her friends. And one of the band members was Philip Bailey. Hey, do you have your microphone? Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm like, I hope you guys can hear it. <laughs> Thank you. That's why she's our director. <laughs> now, I don't know if you know who Philip Bailey is, but us 70s babies, we know who Philip Bailey is. He's a dude that helped start the uh, group Earth, Wind & Fire. So they were all in a band together. She played like the piano and the organ. Now she wasn't in Earth Wind Fire, but that's just one of the people that was there. She also did a lot of pageants because she was trying to raise money so that she could go to college. She did acting classes and singing classes, dancing classes, and she actually performed on stage for a little while. So when she was around 18, is that right? Mm -hmm. Let me try to get this right. Yeah, when she was around 18, she actually did get attacked again by another guy. And at this point, she wasn't able to fend him off. So he was successful in attacking her as well. So for her, she said that she went into self-protection mode. She just didn't trust people, period. She did not let a lot of people in. So it was very hard for her to like trust people and talk and be around people. She said that she finally, finally started dating. And she finally opened up her heart to the young man that she was dating, her boyfriend. And she told him that she had been attacked previously before, twice. And she said that he kind of looked at her, remember this is the 70s, and he said, well, oh, you're tainted. And she was like, she couldn't believe that he said that to her. She was the victim of stuff that had happened to her, and he just like shrugged it off like it was nothing. And plus it took her a hard and a long time to reveal that to other people. So she said, of course he wasn't my boyfriend for very long after that. But again, 
she said that her entire life has been about being safe and protecting herself. <clears throat> so then they moved to, she moved to Los Angeles and she was going to college. She also worked part time in the switchboard, which is kind of like an operator. And there she was discovered by a man named Jack Hill. And then after she was discovered by him, he actually started putting her in different movies, like The Big Doll House and Big Bird Cage. Now I did not see the, I didn't see a lot of these black exploitation movies growing up as a kid, but I did see a couple of them because she has I don't know if she has it or she's just a part of it. It's like um almost like a channel type thing where you can see all of her old movies. I did see Foxy Brown for the first time like two months ago. It was pretty good. So you can actually go on like Amazon and download that streaming service. Streaming service. You can download her, that streaming service so you can see all the black exploitation films. Now my son, who asked me in part one twice, what is a black exploitation movie? So I'm going to define it for you guys. It is movies that were early to mid seventies. They featured black actors. They were written and directed by blacks and they appealed to black urban audiences. Or let me put it another way. They were off the wall black movies by blacks on the cheap that made millions of dollars. So it was like right around the 70s when this happened. Now these particular movies are big controversies in the African American community. One side thinks that they broke existing film stereotypes because they showed strong black men and women that were in control of their own destiny. So therefore, it gave them freedom. Whereas the other side say, it continues stereotypes because it only shows pimps and hookers and drug dealers and easy sex. And it doesn't help to move our community forward. So I don't know where you stand on that side. Watch a couple of movies and figure out did it actually help our people or did it actually hurt our people? Those are black exploitation films. As a matter of fact, uh, my girl, Nichelle Nichols, she did one with Isaac Hayes. I meant to mention that. I forget what it's called. Let me see if I can find it real quick. She did one that she said, nope, that's not for me. Yep, it was called Truck Turner. I was going to But Isaac Hayes. Okay. <laughs> she did one. Okay. So you decide. Now Miss Greer ends up starring in over two hundred of these black exploitation films. Uh, her first one was named Coffee, and in the trailer, she's uh, is quoted as she is the baddest one chick hit squad that ever hit town. Roger Ebert, who was a film critic at the time, he praised her for her acting in that film. She did a lot more movies, and one of them she is like infamous for, and that was Foxy Brown, and that was done in 1974. She also did Sheba Baby and Friday Foster in 1975. She did a prison movie in 1971 called Women in Cages, and again, I did see it on that um, streaming service. I didn't watch the movie, I just saw it. And while she was there on set, she contracted a deadly disease. She actually almost died. She was temporarily blind, and um, for about a month, and it took her one year to recover for that. So as she's working, she's actually um, associated with dating quite a few celebrities. She did Don Cornelius, who was Soul Train. <laughs> she dated Will Chamberlain, although she says she didn't, but he says she did. He was a basketball player. She dated Freddie Prince, who was a comedian. She dated Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who's a basketball player, and she dated Richard Pryor. Now, I'm not going to go through all the guys that she actually dated, but I will go through three because they're kind of interesting. Now, Freddie Prince Jr., they actually met while she was doing the movie Coffee, and they had a, you know, a decent relationship. They even talked about marriage and starting a family. However, she knew that he had like a history of depression, and he was an addict. So she broke up with him, but she said that they remained close. And actually, she is one of the last people to speak to him before he shot himself. 
So she said, you know, she tried to encourage him or whatever, but he just, he had too many issues. Yeah, he was an actor. He was an actor? Yeah. Okay. And she said, I mean, they stayed close and everything, but she said, yeah, she, she really couldn't help him. But she was one of the last people to talk to him before he died. Then she met Richard Pryor. And they actually started dating in the movie Grease Lightning. I did not know this, but Richard Pryor was illiterate. She actually helped helped him learn how to read. And she said she also tried to help him with his addictions. Now, I forgot to mention that she loves animals. She loves animals. She um, actually would visit her grandfather who was on a ranch in Colorado, and they had like horses and goats and chickens and things like this. So one of Richard's producers gave Richard Pryor a mini horse. And he, as a gift, he named the horse Ginger. So they had, he had Ginger. He led Ginger out into the backyard and then he went somewhere. No, he didn't do it. His housekeeper did it. She let the dogs out while they were out. When Richard Pryor and Pam Greer came back, the dogs had viciously attacked the mini horse. That they thought the horse was going to die. So she said that Richard Pryor was dressed up in like a, a bathrobe and he was just like sobbing un uncontrollably. So she said that she took charge of the situation. She put him in the front seat and she put the mini horse in the back seat. And she said like the legs and the tail was hanging out the window of her brand new Jaguar. And she said they're driving down the street looking for a vet that's open. And she was like, people thought that they were crazy because it was Pam Greer and Richard Pryor and a half a horse hanging out of a Jaguar going down the street. So they started following her and causing traffic, which was stopping them from going to the vet. They finally made it to the vet, and the vet was actually able to save Ginger. But she said in that moment, she realized that she could not save Richard. He just had too many addictions that she couldn't deal with. She said at one time, it was like a personal thing that had happened between the two of them intimately, and she was like, nope, I can't, I can't deal with it. And I'll let you research that for yourself, what she was talking about. So they broke up. Because he just, he kept relapsing. Now with Kareem, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, she said that she really did love him. And they met, she met him before he was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He was actually Lou Alcindor. But he was studying to become a Muslim. And as soon as they started, soon after they started dating, he wanted her to convert over to being a Muslim, which would, you know, constrict all the things that she was about. She was all about like freedom and being independent and being a feminist. And she said she was reading a lot of books about Gloria Steinem, who was telling you, you know, you've got to live your life. You've got to do these different things and not just be like a housewife or somebody that where he takes care of you. And she said it was a perfect quote that Gloria had in one of her books. And she said, if you are given things like home and wealth, at any time, that person can come and take it from you. But if you earn it, then no one will ever be able to take that away from you. And remember, intellect is forever. So they have been dating. He wanted her to convert. He calls her on her birthday, she said. She turned 21. He calls her and he's like, Look, either you're going to marry me today at 2 o'clock, or I'm going to marry this other chick who has been prepared for me. And she said, prepared? You mean like a sandwich? And he was like, no, she's being prepared for me. And so she said, I had to get this quote correct. She said, well, I can't make you happy. This makes you happy. So safe travels. And that's how they broke up. And she said every once in a while they would get back in touch with one another, but it was over. And even her and his wife, the one that was prepared for him, they were okay with each other. But she was like, nope, that wasn't about what she wanted to do with her life. So she didn't do it. So she started to work more and more on films and TV shows. She did the cover of Jet Magazine. I'm going to be putting them so many pictures. I mean, she's ever, she was everywhere in the 70s. In the theater, she did her debut in 1985. And at one point... Tarantino actually revitalized her career by putting her in the movie Jackie Baby, which he specifically wrote for her. And I do have to back up one more time. I know this is a lot. Oh, Jackie Baby. I know this is a lot, 
But I have to I have to put it in here just so I can make my point. She said that when she was 20 years old, she was attacked again by another guy who was a 300 pound ex retired football player. That's as specific as she would go. Because she was waiting for her cousin to come pick her up because the cousin was supposed to be like her mentor or something. And she said this she wasn't having it this time. She actually fought back. She attacked him. She said she attacked him with everything she had within her, physically and with furniture. And at this time, she had already been studying martial arts. And she said, and guys, y'all have to excuse me, but I'm quoting her directly. She said she kicked the boop out of him. Insert what you think boop means. So after that, she was like, yeah, I just don't want to be attractive anymore. Because apparently, if you are attractive, people will attack you. And even in some guys' minds, if you're not attractive, if you're ugly, they will attack you. And then people won't believe you because you're ugly. So at this point, she's like, she wouldn't shave her legs. <laughs> she wouldn't take care of herself. She was like, I don't want to be attractive. I don't even know why people think I'm attractive anyway. Because she said, she, in her mind, she was thinking, if you're attractive, then you will get attacked. So then she goes on with her career, and she wins Golden Globes, and SAG Awards, Satellite Awards, Saturn Awards, and Daytime Emmys. She meets a lot of celebrities, and they become friends. She tells of a story of the time that she met Sammy Davis Jr. and his wife. Her and Liza Minnelli were friends. Now, these are all big celebrity names. Her and Liza Minnelli, they're friends. Lazarus is like, let's go over to Sammy Davis Jr. house and we'll have a nice party. Elizabeth Taylor is going to be there too. And she's like, you know what, I really don't want to go because I don't like going to different places. I must protect myself. And she's like, come on, bro, everybody's going to be there. Let's just go. So she goes there. They're all sitting around at the dinner party. And Sammy Davis Jr. starts to hit on her hard in front of his wife. And she just couldn't believe it. And she looks at Eliza and um, Elizabeth Taylor. She's like, does he always do this? And they laughed and like, yeah, man, he always does. Like, don't worry about it. That's not a thing. So she's like, okay. I remember, she's real suspicious of people. She's like, okay, whatever. So she goes to the bathroom. When she comes out, he is now aggressively hitting on her. He is aggressively hitting on her so much that they actually had to sneak her out and put her in the back seat of her car, put Liza Minnelli's jacket on top of her, and they had to get her out of the house because that's how bad he was hitting on her. So, you know, even she was just trying to go to parties and stuff, and people would just be so enamored with her. So after that, <laughs> she was like, I just want to go to Colorado. I'm, I'm, trying to be, I'm not trying to be in this biz business anymore. I'm just going to get me a ranch there, and I'm just going to chill. But an agent came to her and told her, hey, we will protect you. Because back then, they would let like female actresses and models and stuff go out on their own. It was kind of like a, uh, uh, what was it called? a casting couch type situation. And she just wasn't having that because she was about protecting herself. But this particular agent, she said that she credits him for a, not, a lot of stuff not happening to her because he always would protect her. He always would be there. Or he always would make sure that a body, bodyguard was there so that she could feel safe and secure. So she started doing more work because of him. She got an NAACP award. Then in the 90s, a young rapper came to her. And the rapper said that she wanted to use her name, Foxy Brown. Now, the rapper said she thought it was going to be a big problem because everybody knows that Pam Greer is Foxy Brown. So she asked her, and Pam said, sure, you can use it, because all women are Foxy Brown. Now, I would like to end this particular series with this. With Pam, I did think of her one way, but as I was reading her story and found, hearing all the strength that was in her, you know, inside and outside, to me, she used, you know, she used that, those, those things that happened to her to protect herself. Then in those instances, she found her inner strength and she wouldn't let what happened to her change her. She's quoted as saying, there will be pain in this life, but you can survive it. 
and you can make it make you stronger and protect you from other instances. Like when I was in relationships, I wanted to save their lives, but I had to save my own. And that was Miss Pam Brown. So, that was the eight women of sex symbols of the 70s. I really had a good time doing this video. It was interesting remembering all these different women and hearing about their different stories. If you are interested in me doing more about sex symbols, 60s, 30s, 20s, let's talk. Go ahead and comment below. We're going to go ahead and continue to eat on this. Again, please like, share, subscribe, and hit that notification button. Thank you so much, guys, for watching this video, and I will see you next week. Bye, guys.